Hello, everyone, and welcome to time series tutorials with Conrad. Uh, today, we are doing hierarchical time series, and we have we have been facing some technical difficulties, but I hope the stream will go fine. So let's see. OK. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Apologies about the slight delay. We seem to have a probably Abhishek mentioned. I don't know what he said because I literally can't hear him. But that's the perils of modern technology, I'm afraid. Uh, glad you could find the time today to join us. Uh, today we'll be talking about hierarchical time series, uh, which is a topic that I wanted to talk about for a while, among other reasons, as an excuse to sort of educate myself about it. Uh, as usual, the notebook that I'm using is, well, it's publicly on Kaggle and it's also added as a comment uh, as in the description of this video on YouTube where you are presumably watching it. So without further ado, uh, since we lost a little bit of time, uh, hierarchical time series is a topic you pretty much encounter in, in just about any business application you can think of. Uh, things like you have sales. Uh, okay, that's good. Uh, sales, you can have that. That's an example we'll actually be using. Uh, say you have a type of product that's sold in multiple stores across geographic location or something. So you can have different parts of the country. In each part of the country, you can have different stores. And then in each of them, you can have different types of products. So if you want to build predictions, there's, of course, always a way to do it at the granular level or all simultaneously. Trouble is, you would like them to play nice together so that you don't get mismatches. And that's sort of what hierarchical time series is about. Uh, the simplest example, uh, as you can see in this diagram, you can have a well, total aggregate. You have two categories and then some subcategories within each within each individual category. Uh, strictly speaking, hierarchical time series uh, are about the situation where each subcategory fits uniquely under only one possible node in a tree, but that's not really super necessary. Uh, if you, but if you are a bit of a, a bit pedantic on that side, then it's useful to keep the distinction that this would be strictly speaking hierarchical. And if different categories can occur in different sub subcategories can occur, say in here in, and in this category, then it's more of a group time series. Not super important as a point, but worth mentioning. Uh, what's a typical thing about? Uh, hierarchical structure, you need things to be additive so that total is a sum of the categories. Then category one is the sum of the three subcategories we have underneath it, category two, etc. Uh, the, the, the difference between this, um, let's say, episode and some of the other ones is that previously we talked about different methodologies or classes of models. Uh, hierarchical time series are not a methodology in their own right. They are sort of, uh, or they are the class of models. They are more of an aggregate approach. As in, however you generate the individual forecasts at the different levels in the hierarchy, uh, depending on that, uh, you, I mean, it's kind of agnostic to those. Uh, hierarchical time series are about reconciling those forecasts. So reconciliation means producing forecasts that are coherent. So obey this kind of relationship that the logical, the logical relationships hold. Total cannot be bigger than the sum of an individual components, nor should it be smaller. We live in an imperfect world, so reconciling the forecasts created in different methods doesn't always work perfectly, but we can do quite a bit to make sure the mismatches are as small as possible. Uh, the reason this is also useful is that to stick to the business type of example, uh, there can be dependencies between different levels. So if you predict each of them individually in isolation, you are ignoring the fact that, well, the higher level series is a sum of the series operating at lower levels. Uh, the way this episode is structured is that first we need to do a little bit of preparation work to see how 
how the hierarchical structure operates and how it can be encoded into, into modeling concepts. And then as a reward for that, we'll see how easy it becomes to, to apply it to different problems. So we have the three main concepts, three main, what would you call it, components that need to uh, come into this. First, we have the base forecasts. Not enough a lot to say about that. We've been talking for a couple of episodes now about different manner, different manners in which we can uh, generate forecasts for different time series. Like I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really matter what you pick. You can say, sticking to, the, to that example, maybe you predict a total using one method, category one, category two, say, I don't know, total you do with Arima, uh, category one and two with profit, and then the individual sub-series with whichever method you uh, found your, well, you found appealing from the, um, from the episode about demand for sales and demand forecasting, doesn't really matter. Uh, or maybe you want to, you prefer instead to use the same for all, for all the levels, irrelevant. Hierarchical reconciliation of time series, that's kind of agnostic to that. So we won't spend an awful lot of time on it. The, re the relevant bit, which is simple conceptually, but takes a little bit of work to set up, is the summing matrix. Summing matrix it does pretty much what it says on the box. Namely, uh, if you look at the diagram here, in total, we have one, two, three, six, nine levels in the series. Three on the lowest level, two on the intermediate one, and one total aggregate. That's nine in total. And we have six series on the lowest level, or to use this example, five. And this is what you also see here. In columns, you have the uh, most granular series that are available, the ones that can only be summed and do not have, are not sums themselves. And in rows, you have the uh, sort of nodes in the hierarchy that you map them to. And the entire summation matrix is a, a binary matrix where uh, for total, we have a row of ones, that means every single row needs to add up to form total. Category one has ones only here because, it on, because only those two categories belong into category one and form it when we aggregate and zeros elsewhere. Uh, category two, the other way around. Subcategory one and two don't belong here, hence zeros. And then uh, subcategories three, four, five do, hence ones. And then we have effectively a diagonal matrix here. Subcategory one only belongs to itself or on top of other things. Two only to two, etc. Uh, so that's the basic setup that we need to look at uh, if we want to construct a, a summation matrix. And then we have the uh, mapping matrix. The way we are, uh, what the mapping matrix does is you multiply it by the summing matrix and the base forecasts, base forecast, and that's how you arrive at coherent forecasts. The idea, as I mentioned earlier, in an ideal case uh, is to have something that matches it ideal, in an ideal fashion. That doesn't happen in practice, much as, well, every model you ever construct is going to have some sort of error. So what we want is minimal variance, minimal discrepancy be it, uh, between what's actually achieved and uh, what we had in the original data. We will use uh, one of my favorite competitions on Kaggle as a reference point uh, in, in recent years, namely the M5 competition, because the, the nice aspect of this one is that the whole idea there was to use a hierarchical, a hierarchical data set on Walmart sales. And this was split across uh, three states, California, Texas, and Wisconsin, and then multiple stores in each one, multiple products, etc. Uh, because this is mostly for the sake of demonstration, I, I subset it, well, and also to make sure that this notebook executed in reasonable time, uh, just to a single product. But you can, you can, of course, extend it further. And towards the end, we will look uh, we'll show how this methodology can be applied also to, um, well, time series with more levels in the in the overall hierarchy. 
So the first thing we do, uh, by the way, uh, shout out to the people whose work I am leveraging today, creators of the hierarchical forecast package from the command called Mixtla. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I mean, they're from Mexico and I don't speak Spanish, so there's a possibility I'm doing it wrong, in which case I apologize. Uh, what they've done is that they, what is well, what they have done for hierarchical time series is pretty much what Prophet did for things that work out of the box. You need a little bit of extra work, but then it's pretty much plug and play. Uh, whereas otherwise, you would have just had to write aggregation, those kinds of things yourself. Question. Yes, I'm pausing. Do similar concepts uh, apply to geospatial time series forecasts also? Probably, probably, but uh, sorry, no. Yes, they do. Unfortunately, I couldn't, I, I didn't include uh, geospatial data here, although I wanted to, uh, because I couldn't find a decent sized geospatial uh, data series. Well, that was a smaller problem. Bigger one, I didn't have time to write it from scratch myself. And R does, seems to have a lot of stuff around uh, spatial statistics. Python, for some weird reason, does not. I mean, there's very few places left where R, where R is still beating Python, and this seems to be one of them. But the general answer, yes. Yes, the, the same thing would apply. Although I would imagine if it's spatial, you could you probably have to take more than just, you have to take the interactions a bit more into account. Because this is sort of well, pretty simple. Total is just the sum of those three regions. And if you look at something that's two dimensional, uh, I would guess there's more interactions to take into account. I mean, there's a reason spatial statistics is a separate field. Um, not sure if there are any more questions. Normally I would have seen the other window, but today for some reason I don't. Okay, sailing on. Uh, so, uh, pretty standard stuff. We take the we take the data from the competition, format it to something reasonably nice, uh, record the dates, da, da, da. standard panda stuff. This is what our ultimate uh, ultimate output data set looks like. So we have a timestamp, we have the store ID, and we have the state ID. Our life is all, all right. our life is already made a little bit easier here because the store ID is uh, well distinct. Uh, within state, as in we know it's California store one and not for instance store one, in which case we would, we would need a little bit of extra. But the important bit here is you need a unique identifier per level in the hierarchy so that it's clear that it cannot be confused with anything else. This is what it looks like. Uh, what hierarchical forecast package when we are using uh, requires is having the data in long format. So for, at each level in the hierarchy, date, unique identifier on this level in the hierarchy, and then the value corresponding to this entry, a bunch of group buys. This is what it comes down to. We want create, we want to create the summary at individual store levels, group by date and store, reformat, boom, and then timestamp uh, DS I'm fairly certain that's because they are using profit underneath at one point again the idiosyncrasies of having something separate question yes pausing right now why did we only take it when we did submission is it to bonus number no there were only three I'm fairly certain in the data that there were only three stores in California but maybe I subset it uh, to uh, again to shrink the data a little bit uh I'd have to look at the raw data to be perfectly honest, but I'm fairly certain in the original there were only f there were three in California, three in Texas, and four in Wisconsin. Uh, <coughs> so no, no special reason, no special reason behind it. Uh, sailing on, aggregation at individual level, aggregation at state level, exact same idea. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that if I just the previous question, 
apologies, there's going to be a communication like this because I'm only getting feedback from Abhishek via the chat. Uh, state level, same thing, total we aggregate, then we combine all three, just concatenate them row wise. Uh, and this is what we get. Timestamp, unique ID within a level in the, oh, there were actually four in California and in, in three indexes, whatever. Same thing. And uh, then we get the individual values per timestamp and per this level in the, in the, in the hierarchy. So fairly, fairly standard stuff so far. Uh, this means we now have the series encoded in such a manner that we can take care of the additive representation that we need. So total is the sum of the sales in all three states. California, oh, I actually omitted CA4 here, sorry. Uh, California is the sum of its stores, Texas it's yada yada, standard stuff. Uh, what I mentioned earlier is then the next step, if you recall from above, uh, was the summation matrix. So in rows, we have all the possible levels in the hierarchy, all the series at all levels, and in columns, we have only the most granular ones, which corresponds to, well, what is it that we need to sum into what? And that is the matrix that we are that we want to create here. Uh, I created the variable x set somewhere here, so that's my list of that's my list of unique series IDs at the lowest, most granular level, uh, and that's list two, sorted, and then list one. That's all the possible levels in the hierarchy. Obviously list one being longer than, than list two. We create a, a data frame, label it appropriately with uh, rows, then and set once in the places that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> so that the structure of the whole thing represents, well, the, the logical order. So total has once everywhere, because all of those belong in the total aggregate. CA only has the free, actually, I should have given this one, sorry, typo, uh, free. Uh, the free California stores only belong to themselves. Texas has those free, etc. Essentially, applicate question, yes. If we didn't, what's going on? Well, yes, we can ignore total but that means we just omit this level in the hierarchy. We pretend it's not there uh, because, like, uh, uh, remember I mentioned earlier, this is not a methodology, this is not a model class. This is a method, this is a framework for reconciling, for reconciliation, which means if you don't have total, fine, you will only, re only reconcile up to state level. But if you don't have the total, then, well, then you can't reconcile against it. So, so this one will not be there. So no, the package will not take care of it itself. Okay, sailing on. Uh, I hope it's clear regarding the structure of the matrix. One last thing, we need to encode what actually belongs to what in which logical order, not just in the matrix. And that's what the tags, uh, well, I borrowed the term, the name from the original documentation, what the tax variable is for. So country level, that's our total. States, those are the free states. And then those are the uh, underlying levels in the hierarchy. So, so you, the, best way you, the best way to think about it, um, tags describes which entities are in, exist in which level. And then the summing matrix makes uh, concrete what the relationships are between them. So what needs to be aggregated to come up with which level. So far, so good, I hope. Uh, then reasonably standard stuff, we will just pick the last seven days to use as our test, well, or validation set really, split. Uh, because the only point, uh, this is only a demonstration. So I'm going through the line of least resistance and I'm using Autorima. 
That's not what I would call perfect forecast here, starting with the fact that sales, especially at the granular, granular level, uh, well, in general, they cannot be negative. And in particular, on the most granular level, they can be zero at times. And that's not something that Arima out of the box can handle very well. But as they used to write in textbooks when I was a student, uh, Im improving this to a more realistic setup is, is a, left as an exercise to the reader. Well, viewer in this case. The nice thing here is that the creators of the hierarchical forecast package were kind enough to create a method where you just can just automatically build forecasts over uh, based on a time frame on all levels. Remember, this is the subset of our aggregated data frame already in the long format. So that's the only thing we need to do. And then this data frame, which models do we want to use? If you care, then you can create uh, forecasts with more with multiple models and then uh, well compare them against each other uh, frequency you can parallelize it because at this stage we are behaving or assuming that there is no relationship between those series so no reason not why not to parallelize it forecast on a given horizon yada yada uh, we can have a quick look at what the at what the metrics of the or the, or the errors look like on the data, so original timestamp, real values, predicted values, da da da. This is our overall mean squared error. This is ever this is mean squared RMSE on the country level, state level, and individual store level. Okay, we've done a little bit of gymnastics around uh, preparing the basis. Like, as I warned you at the beginning, there is a little bit of preparation to do, but then courtesy of the creators of hierarchical forecast, things just start to pop up as special cases. So assuming we have all those uh, forecasts generated at each level, how can we aggregate them and make sure that things are well as consistent with each other as possible? First and simplest method, bottom up. We predict each of the lowest level series, and then we sum those to get city level, and then sum those to get a national, to get a complete total. How do we go about it? We define a list of a model of um, methods, models, whatever you call it, uh, called reconcilers. Then we instantiate a hierarchical reconciliation object where we specify which reconcilers to use, and then reconcile. Bottom up start lowest possible level and then keep adding upwards uh, the what we get as a result of that well, another nice thing saves you having to write the boilerplate yourself is a method called hierarchical evaluation and this is what it does it treats uh, the reason you see ones here and percentages here is that it normalizes relative to the uh, base forecast that you had, the row ones are reconciled ones, and it tells you at each level, did it help, did, did it hurt things or not? And as you can see, if this is a reference, then overall mean squared error across all levels dropped by 6%, not bad. It Things are a little worse on the country level. Things are substantially better on the state level, and they are unchanged. On the, on the most granular level, namely individual stores, because that's what we started from. So we didn't touch those forecasts. We only uh, adjusted the ones on higher levels in the hierarchy, because keep in mind, we are using the bottom-up method. Mm, no questions, I, if, I, if I see correctly. So let me continue. Da, 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 da. And we also can, can have a can have a quick comparison in absolute numbers. I actually had to write a wrap around this one because for some reason I couldn't dig up the method to do it using the package itself. So as I, as as we saw, things are better across all uh, levels jointly. A little worse on country level, better on a state level, and unchanged on individual store level. Good news. We're not losing anything. Uh, we're not losing in any information from as a result of looking at too high a level in the hierarchy. Uh, bad news, well, as usual, individual stores can be noisy. 
when you lump them together, lowest level series, things tend to get, informally speaking, averaged out, which means get less noisy at higher levels. Pick your poison, bias variance trade off, whatever your preferred analogy in this instance is. Yes, question. Um, no, my scaling and weighing is done to RMC here. By here, I assume you mean the competition itself, because uh, I am not doing any scaling, really. I'm sorry, I'm not doing any weighting. I am doing scaling as in normalizing relative to the baseline. Uh, that's the only scaling that I'm actually doing here. Uh, why was it done, the way scaling and weighting in uh, the M5? I don't know. I wish I did, because it was a painful experience to try to replicate that metric. And I know, I remember I had a lot of fun uh, trying to trying to get it to work, especially feeding a custom metric into uh, as an objective function. Okay, that was the only one, so sailing on. Uh, we, we did bottom up. So start from the most granular level in the hierarchy and then ag aggregate upwards. Oh, sorry, this is a yes, yes, they, yes, they did. Yes, they did the way that, that that's what I'm referring to. That's why I said that uh, that was fun because you had to write a custom metric to, well, to optimize anything. Not to mention that, well, the, the weight, if I remember correctly, get, coming up with the weights was also a bit of an entertainment, but at least they were explicit. Uh, we started with top down, uh, sorry, with bottom up. So, well, as the name suggests, bottom up. Uh, the opposite idea is top down. We start with the most aggregate level in the hierarchy that we can think of. So, uh, full total. And then averaging the proportion, say historically on average, Atlanta was 60%, Chicago 40 of the of the total national sales. Uh, we're going to generate the forecast going forward on total and then adjust to the 40% and 60% of the of the total forecast that has been created. And similarly, uh, from city to uh, county or district level. That's the idea here. Uh, same, same thing as before. Remember I mentioned, you you do a little bit of work to understand what this actually does. And then you just keep swapping methods. So again, reconcilers, top down method forecast proportions, because you just average the historical proportion uh, of a relation, sort of linear relationship between the two series. Da, 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 da. Hierarchical evaluation. Uh, what happens overall if we do top down forecast? In total, the mean squared error across all series jointly gets a little bit worse. Uh, it's unchanged relative to the baseline on country level because that was our starting point. Much as in the preceding case, we didn't touch the most granular ones. Here, we are not touching the topmost one. Gets a little better on the level immediately underneath the top. So correcting for, uh, towards historical forecasts seems to have some positive effect, but it gets substantially worse on the most granular level in the hierarchy. Uh, price to pay. Same idea as before, re rewritten into um, absolute numbers. Little worse in total, unchanged on country level. Um, slightly improved on state level, massively worse, or massively 20% relative increase is probably pretty massive on an individual store level. Mm, any questions? Oh. Mm. That is a good one. Mm. Not with, probably not without going full uh, Bayesian or something like this, because the most natural framework I can think of where you try to uh, 
look at the hierarchical structure and not just point forecasts, which is what we are doing here, but also uncertainty around them, that would be something like a Bayesian hierarchical model. I've seen it done for, uh, well, linear models or general, generalized linear models. That probably means you can adapt it for, for time series, but the math will get a little bit more involved. So as a general idea, I would say yes. Uh, in terms of how to do it, either specify a full-blown Bayesian structure, and I mean Bayesian statistics. <laughs> we can have a whole separate series on Bayesian statistics. Uh, or you go very crude and brutal, uh, essentially you bootstrap. You rerun what I've done here several times, at each point dropping a different, different subset of the data, which means at each point, you, uh, it's not even that. It's not, it's not even that. In this instance, this is not R versus Python, uh, because, uh, I mean, allow me to rephrase it. There's a bigger chance that what I'm talking about has been done in R than a chance that it has been done in Python. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, but like, like I said, worst case scenario, if we don't have a clear idea, we just bootstrap. We just drop different points, different po because what do we get here as an output? We're going to get just a matrix, a point forecast at each level in the hierarchy. So you can go full non-parametric, drop the same uh, observe the same chunk of observations, a month, a week or something, uh, at random at different points in the data, rerun this whole thing again, which means at each, you what, what will you arrive at? Right now, at each terminal node, we have the prediction. What you will have if you run it a bunch of times as bootstrap, you'll get a bunch of predictions. Just do a non-parametric confidence interval around it. It's not super elegant, but it has the advantage that it's, well, it works. That, that would be my, my idea here. Any more questions or shall we sail on? Yes where one would prefer top-down versus bottom-up. What do you care about more? What do you care about? If, do you care about high-level aggregates? Uh, then I would probably go uh, bottom-up because you will get all the, you will not lose any information. But if you mostly care about adjusting for the fact that your lower lower level time series are extremely noisy, then I would go top-down. Or as usual with these things, and that's the next uh, section, mm, you combine the two. In terms of use cases, business specific. B business specific, there's no general reason. It's it's about what's more important from, from your application point of view. Sailing on, I, let's continue, okay. Uh, as I mentioned, we had top down, we had bottom up. What's an, what's the most natural thing to do? Middle out. In this instance, if we have three levels in the hierarchy, say we pick the city level, we do bottom up to the top national level and then top down towards the more granular levels. Uh, we handle it the same. I mean, it's literally a combination of those of the previous two, where you uh, the only thing you really need to do is pick what's your middle level in on which you trust the forecasts, and then bottom up from there and top down downwards. Uh, that means the middle out reconciler has well the two extra arguments. What's the level? That's where the tag variable comes in, because that's how we identify this group of uh, of variables. And the top down, how do we, um, by in what manner do we reconcile downwards? Da 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 da. Same thing as before. Well, it turns out combining the two things isn't two things different. Two different things is not always necessarily the best idea, because as you can see here. Uh, this is the literally the worst of both words because it made in this instance in this data set and this time period that's also important uh, this makes both the country and the store forecast levels inferior compared to would have been if we had ignored 
everything uh, about about the baseline happens well double check the intuition here finally uh what what can we do if we go if we go beyond just a simple geometric interpretation well geometric you can call it that uh, mean trace that's sort of the idea is like top down it's only one direction bottom up is only one direction uh middle out one direction here one direction there obviously the next question people ask okay can we try to take every level and their interaction into account simultaneously and that's how the uh, minimal trace uh, method was born basic idea we assume our forecasts are unbiased quick reminder from probability theory unbiased meaning expected value is equal to the target uh, as an analogy ordinary linear regression is unbiased but it has a huge variance uh, lasso or reach are not unbiased they have a much smaller variance enter bias variance trade-off uh, so that's the assumption they are making here we want to minimize the variation variance in this, in this instance across all levels simultaneously uh, there's a link to the original paper if if I remember correctly Hindman was involved because of course yeah uh, I actually suggest that you read it because it's a rather nice piece of work and fairly fairly modern also. How do we go about this? Mean trace as a as a reconciler that we select, uh, ordinary least squares as a reconciliation method because we need to calibrate somehow. Hence the overall variance of the forecasts. Hierarchical reconciliation. Tada! What do we get as a result? As you can see, overall. The situation has improved uh however it's well it's gotten a little worse on the country level it's gotten a little bit a little worse on the store level but it's substantially better on the middle level uh, it's not like there is necessarily an extremely deep wisdom in this particular instance so that every time you touch you touch uh, a hierarchical forecast problem it's always going to be like this but it might be so it's it's worth exploring because at the end of the day if you do this you well you are simultaneously sort of taking into account the behavior of the series at different levels so this is the mean trace method and then we confirm the intuition around this one any questions don't seem to me okay so I started actually writing this one and then I looked at my own code when I was doing the because uh, I wanted to apply all the methods jointly and then I was like no I am not showing that code in public that's why what's in the notebook at this moment is a little bit work in progress but uh, I wanted to start demonstrating at least in the three minutes we have left uh, what happens if we have data with more levels in the hierarchy uh, this is a Kaggle data set, uh, apparently beverage sales in Greece. This one is a little more involved than or more degrees of freedom, I guess you could say, because apart from Tyson, you have city, well, latitude and longitude we can skip. Uh, in each city, we have a shop. In each shop, we have multiple brands and each brand can come in a different container and a different capacity. Well, as an extra entertainment, oh no, it's, it's just in liters, so that's not super important. Uh, this is something that we can also, well, for starters, we have price and quantity, so you can look at value, you can look at quantity, whatever your heart's desire. Uh, a data set like this uh, requires a little bit of extra work because here we have shop one, shop two, and what shop whatever for each city which means we can't just directly plug it into the format we we're using before we need to actually work a little bit on the columns remember i mentioned earlier the identifier of a node on, on each level in the hierarchy has to be unique within this level which means we can't have shop one for i don't know athens and heraklion uh, we need to make it more specific so shop is here then we have brand 
then we have container for the same reason and we have capacity and then we start aggregating the data in the same manner as before group sum the quantity on this level and this is what we go with unique id and then uh, and this was the part where I sort of gave up because I was trying to uh, create a summation matrix. And that's actually the most, uh, I would almost say, annoying part, uh, yeah. unless you feel like filling it out manually. I mean, the, in the original example I used, yes, uh, it was faster. But in this instance, you need to think a little bit if you, unless you feel like filling out the 500 by 300 matrix manually. Yes, question. What are the features of M5 data? In this instance, I didn't. I didn't, I ignored it completely because uh, I wanted a minimal working example. So uh, this was enough because I used Arima. So. If we had done it with something like profit, then we would have combined the other features from the um, calendar, and then we could have used it for on the on the granular level. Uh, I mean, the main reason, honestly, honestly, the main reason I needed calendar here is if you look at the raw data that's attached to this notebook, uh, you're gonna see that what they have there is. Uh, the days, the date is actually only encoded as D1, D2, etc. in the actual sales data frame. And to map it to normal dates that you can convert with pandas and whatnot, uh, you need to combine it with the calendar data frame. And that's the only reason I needed the calendar one, to, to map it into something that's readable and interpretable later. Any more questions? Nope. Uh, in that case, we are perfectly on time. So our apologies for the slight delay and the fact that, yeah, this one started a little later. Uh, I will wrap up the, the, the uh, remaining part with looking at the use case uh, today or tomorrow. So if you are interested how this works, uh, check it out. And that would be it for this episode. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and we'll see each other in August when people, including yours truly, start coming back from vacation. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>